Okay, I'm going to start again here. Welcome to the Mini Storage Messenger Self Storage Webinar Series. I'm Poppy Behrens, publisher of Mini Co Incorporated, and we're delighted to have you in the audience today. This is one of several informative webinars planned for self storage owners, operators, managers, investors, developers, and other industry professionals. The topic of today's webinar is Unique Legal Topics for Self Storage Owners and Managers, sponsored by Lodi California based Litton Property Management. Our presenter is Tom Litton well-known self-storage industry expert who heads Litton Property Management and the Self-Storage Management Division of Litton Management and Consulting. Tom began his self-storage career when the industry was in his infancy and has managed over 150 self-storage facilities in 11 states. He currently manages and or owns 21 commercial properties in Indiana and California and also fee manages and consults on a daily basis in the United States, Australia, New Zealand, France, England, Scotland, and Canada. Tom has conducted more than 150 seminars worldwide on various topics regarding the self-storage industry, operations, management, development, and ownership. His latest books, Auditing Self-Storage, Preventing Employee Theft and Embezzlement, and The Key to Success, How to Manage Self-Storage, are both available for Minico Publishing. 2010 marks the 31st anniversary of the Mini Storage Messenger, the original voice of the self-storage industry. Each issue of Messenger provides readers with in-depth news and information. Our cover stories and feature articles explore the most timely industry topics and trends. In addition, monthly columns contributed by industry experts and accomplished business professionals address a wide range of topics including security, facility operations, technology, legal issues, legislative updates, construction, and development. We also publish a variety of other self-storage data sources so that you, such as those you see listed on your screen. For more information, please visit us at ministoragemessenger.com. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing on demand from our archives at ministoragemessenger.com. We invite you to submit questions throughout today's webinar. To do so, just simply type your question into the question area and click send. While we will try to answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A period at the end of the webinar, those that cannot be answered due to time constraints will be answered by Tom by way of email once the webinar has concluded. Today's presentation should run about 45 minutes with the remainder of the hour open to questions and answers. And now, after a bit of a sticky start, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Tom. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, Poppy. How are you? I am good. Great. Hey, I'm glad all of you had uh, time in your schedules to sit in on this topic. And it's an interesting topic, to say the least, because it's unique legal, legal topics for self-storage owners and managers. And I put these topics together because they're topics that I see on a daily basis, not only as a professional property manager, but a consultant, an expert witness, and a student of the law, as well as an auctioneer. And so a lot of the topics that we're going to talk about today are topics that occur in the industry almost on a daily basis, but you don't hear much discussion about them because you know the reality is, is we only have so much time at, at conventions and we only have so much space in our magazine to talk about all of the things that really do affect us in the self-storage business. So we're going to talk about some unique legal topics. And the reality is, is I could have picked out 300 topics to talk about, but I, I hand selected some topics that are sort of timely because of things that have been happening out in the field on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're going to talk about some of those types of topics. So we start off by sort of having a brief discussion about understanding the law because words have meanings. And one of the things that we're seeing now is that our state associations in conjunction with the Self-Storage Association is going in and they're changing uh, many of the lien statutes in various states. And we're changing those statutes so that we can improve and uh, sort of enhance the meaning of some of the words that we use. But we're also doing things that actually make us more not only competitive, but actually more consumer friendly by changing some of the statutes. Because back when most self-storage statute, statutes were passed, it was back in the early 80s. And life has changed rather dramatically since then. But I need you to sort of keep this one concept in mind, that words have meaning. And all self-storage statutes have unique meanings and implications. And sometimes they're not readily, uh, they're not readily understood unless you're a, a hardcore student of the law. So many legal top 
topics are actually quite obscure, and they're not always readily apparent. So I'm going to point some of those things out. And at the end of this webinar, you're going to say to yourself, wow, that's interesting. I did not know that that meant that, or I didn't even know that existed. Now, we're going to be talking about basically 48 states statutes in a generic sense. But we also have Washington, D.C. So technically, we have 49 bodies of law that we're going to talk about. And that's just in the lien foreclosure statutes. We still have two states that use other types of law to actually foreclose on property and to sell it. But we have two states that do not have specific self-storage lien statutes, which is Nebraska and Alaska. So those two states uh, use different types of laws, as well as the Canadians use a different type of law. Whereas in self-storage, we have something pretty specific to look at in 48 states in Washington, D.C. So once again, many of these legal topics are obscure, and they're not readily apparent. For example, can you tell me which direction the arrow points in the FedEx logo? Or did you know that the FedEx logo even had an arrow in it? Well, the law is like this in many ways, and you'll see in a minute what I'm talking about. If you look at that FedEx logo, you'll notice that there actually is an arrow built into the logo. So words do have meaning, and self-storage statutes create duties and obligations through the words that are used, both legal and through common usage in the industry. So let's talk about what some of those are. Now, you need to do your own research. All self-storage statutes are different in every single state. I've literally read and studied all 49 sets of statutes in 48 states and Washington, D.C. There are similarities in many ways, but no two states are exactly alike. And many states have technical flaws, which are things that the legislators have inserted into your statutes that are tricky, and we'll talk about a few of those. But it's important for you to do your own research and to research the statutes for your specific state. You also want to talk to your owner about some of the issues that we're going to talk about today, as well as other issues that may come up simply from listening to me and getting ideas, or maybe I might pluck a cord, which is a legal issue that you've encountered before, but you didn't quite know how to handle. You want to make sure that you consult your attorney before you make any changes, which is really critical, because I know uh, Carlos Coslow, very good friend, uh, Jeffrey Greenberger, uh, Scott Zucker, they all try to do a, a really good job in giving you uh, their interpretation of the statutes and the laws and the caveats and the things to watch out for. But the reality is, is each individual state is different. So any attorney will tell you that you need to consult an attorney in your state before you make any specific changes. So I'm going to be giving you some things to think about, but it's your job to carry this through. And then lastly, you want to make sure you follow the law in your state strictly. Uh, courts will normally hold self-storage facilities to a strict compliance standard. In other words, the legislators and the court system feels as though since we are given very specific remedies for foreclosing on property, they expect us to follow those statutes exactly without fail. So the standard that you will almost always be held to is what we call the strict compliance standard, which is different than the substantial compliance standard. You know, the substantial compliance standard is kind of like horseshoes. It depends on how close you get. But in self-storage, we're held to a strict compliance standard. And so if the law says you have to have 14 days, you can have 15, but you can't have 13. What about licensing? It's interesting because some states require an auctioneer's license. I got a call from a lady just the other day, and she was talking about auctions, and she said that she didn't have a very good turnout to her auctions, and she was asking my opinion on what she could do to get a better turnout. So the first thing I asked her is I said, what state are you in? And she told me, and I said, well, hold on a second. So I looked in my list, and lo and behold, uh, she was in a state that actually requires you to have an auctioneer's license. And so we had a brief discussion about that. She chose to go through the licensing process and to get her own auctioneer's license. So that's a decision that each individual has to make. But roughly one half of all states, by the way, require you to have an auctioneer's license. Professional auctioneers help justify a commercially reasonable sale. Now, the whole concept of commercially reason reasonable sale came up just recently in Cook versus Public Storage. And in that case, which would probably take us a good hour to thoroughly discuss, in that case, 
the sale method that was used, which is a common sales method used all over the United States, was determined by the appellate court in Wisconsin to not be commercially reasonable, which is actually scary when you think about it. So generally, auctioneers will sell property for higher prices than managers do. And yet we have an industry where probably more facilities conduct their own auctions than facilities that actually hire auctioneers to do this for them. Auctioneers are professionals, and they sell they sell something almost every single day. And they tend to have specialized, specialized knowledge and experience that maybe the, the self-storage manager wouldn't have. Now, for example, I'm a, a licensed auctioneer. I've also attended auctioneer school, which technically makes me a colonel. If you'd like to call me Colonel Tom, you can. But, uh, but when you go to an auctioneer school, you will learn selling methods that you typically don't see in self-storage. But auctioneers are professionals. They sell property every day. They have specialized knowledge. In some states, they have to be licensed. They have experience. I have now sold over 16,000 individual storage spaces over these years. So if I'm called into court, I can justify my actions pretty well. There are many states, like I said, at least 25 states that have auctioneers license requirements. And if you look at this list, you'll see the list of states that, that require auctioneers licenses, Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, all the way to Wisconsin. And so this is not an optional thing. This is a must-have thing. The problem that you run into is that if you don't have an auctioneer's license, if an aggrieved plaintiff sues the storage facility, they will invariably allege that the sale wasn't commercially reasonable because a professional wasn't conducting it. And therefore, the items that were sold didn't derive the same value that they would have derived had a professional licensed auctioneer conducted the sale. Now, in some, in some situations, that true, that's true, but it's not always true. But the bottom line is that in those states, you have to have an auctioneer's license. So check your local city, county, or state governmental offices, too, because many of them require permits. As a matter of fact, almost all large cities require permits. So you may actually be in a state that doesn't require an auctioneer's license, but you need an auction permit for each individual auction. Some states have a voluntary license. Michigan, for example, has a voluntary license. Some states require a license if you sell motor vehicles, but they don't care if you have a license if you sell storage spaces. So Nebraska is like that. So if you conduct auctions and you are not licensed, plaintiffs will make an issue of your non-licensed status. I recommend that you use a professional auctioneer because there are a lot of things that come up on a daily basis in the auctioneering business. And we'll talk about some of those, and you'll see what I mean. Now, most auctions are with reserve unless advertised or stated otherwise. Some state statutes create absolute auctions through the wording in their statutes. Now, let me explain quickly what reserve and absolute mean. Under the Uniform Commercial Code, Section 2-328, it says that all auctions are considered to be auctions with reserve unless you advertise to the contrary or state otherwise. What that means is that the auctioneer has the right to refuse any unacceptable bids. The auctioneer also has the right to set a minimum bid on an item or on a unit. It's called a reserve price. So in those states, if you're the auctioneer and you see that someone's going to buy a unit that you think should sell for $1,000, and the highest bid you get on that unit is $50, you could say 50 once. 50 twice, I'm sorry folks, $50 is not enough, and you can choose not to sell that unit. In other words, you can exercise your reserve right to not sell it because the bid was unacceptable. If you conduct an absolute auction in some states, that means that the auctioneer has no reserve price, and the highest bid wins the auction item or space. If you advertise that auction as being an absolute auction, that's how everything is sold. Once the bidding starts, then the item or the space must be sold to the individual that offers the highest bid, period, without any reservations, without any uh, withdrawal of the item. So once you start the bidding, that's it. It's sold absolute. Now, why would a person advertise that? Well, in some municipalities, some types of sales are absolute auctions. Some real estate sales, for example, are absolute auctions. But when you advertise an absolute auction, you have a tendency to get a much greater turnout, a much greater number of attendees that come to your auction. So as a result, some, uh, some companies actually like to use absolute auctions for that reason. 
Now, here's the problem. The problem is, is that in some states, you don't have any choice. And many of you don't even know this because, let's see if I can get my slide to advance. There we go. In some states, if you read the statute, and you know, we were talking about wording a few minutes ago, if you read the statute, the statutes specify that the property must be sold to the highest bidder. The stat statutes in six different states say this, which means that every auction conducted in those states has to be conducted as an absolute auction. So for example, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, Montana, South Carolina, and Texas. In those states, all of your auctions are conducted as absolute auctions, which means that once the bidding starts, then you have to sell that property to the highest bidder. And you don't have any choice. You don't have the ability to say, I'm sorry, that's not enough. Uh, $50 is not enough when this space should be selling for $1,000. You can't do that. And what's operative is that once the bidding starts, you have to sell that unit, that individual unit. You can cancel an auction uh, with an absolute. Uh, if you publish an absolute auction, you can cancel it after maybe one or two units because of weather or whatever, or you can, you can cancel the entire auction in advance. But once you start calling for bids, for example, on an individual space, you must sell that space for the highest bid, even if it's the tenant standing there buying their own unit back, which is kind of interesting when you think about it. Let's talk about the statute of fraud. If a unit is sold for more than $500, a seller needs a written contract with the buyer. This is under the Uniform Commercial Code in virtually every state in the United States. This is a little known fact, but when you sell a unit for more than $500, a seller, which would be the storage facility, needs a written contract with the buyer. Therefore, if you conduct your own auction or you hire an auctioneer, it doesn't matter. All auction buyers uh, should sign a buyer's agreement in advance. And the buyer's agreement should include, but obviously not limited to, uh, the following. The terms of the auction, the payment instructions, the deposit requirements, when the property has to be removed, what time frame, the remedy for non-removal, which is usually forfeiture, and then a release of liability uh, while the purchaser is on the premises. So if you sell a unit for more than $500, you need a written agreement. If you don't have a written agreement, your buyer could say, you know, I thought it over. I decided I don't want that space after all. And if, it, if the bid was higher than $500, then you have no recourse. The person could literally just walk away. And uh, then you're stuck with either reviving the last highest bidder to see if perhaps they want to buy it, or you've got to hold that space and then sell it at the next auction. Flat fee auctioneers. Some areas, now this is primarily Illinois for some reason, I'm not quite sure why, but some areas pay their auctioneers a flat fee to auction. And this practice is not advisable because flat fee auctioneers are simply bid callers. Good auctioneers are auction marketers. And so if you pay your auctioneer a flat percentage, they have no incentive to try to sell the property for its highest and best price. So an auctioneer that works on percentage has an incentive to get higher prices for the items that are sold. Most auctioneers charge 10 to 25% for storage auctions. Some auctioneers will charge the storage facility less, like maybe 15%, uh, but then they'll charge a buyer's premium, and that's where the buyer pays an added percentage on top of their bid. So flat fee compensation may fail to qualify as a commercially reasonable method of selling items if you ever have to go to court. So I discourage you from using flat fee auctioneers. What about the changing auction methods? Well, I mentioned briefly, briefly that uh, we're rethinking our approach to what constitutes a commercially reasonable sale. And you might need to start adjusting your selling methods. And I say this because in Cook versus Public Storage, we got a big surprise. The courts recently referred to our industry standard of not allowing bidders to closely inspect the property or to open boxes. They said that that constituted a blind sale. And they determined, they meaning an appellate court, which is a published decision, determined that it's not commercially reasonable to sell things that way. So for years, our bidders have been told that they have to stand outside the space and look in, that no items can be touched or disturbed, everything is sold as is, where is, buyers must pay in cash only, and the managers don't go into the space, they don't open boxes, they don't display items, they don't under, uncover items, they don't disturb the contents in any way. Well, that's changing. So technology is now changing how we prepare, advertise, and market. 
uh, delinquent storage spaces. So emerging technology now gives us much greater power to achieve higher bids and recoveries. So I'm going to tell you really quickly what I do. These are all things that I do that I've experimented with. And if you want to call me uh, after the webinar and discuss it, I'd be more than willing to do that. I now engage what I call the pre-sale inventory. This is very similar to what we've been doing for years. So it's now performed in much greater detail. In other words, we actually write down more items that we see, and we use a light, and we kind of shine it around. We spend a little bit more time inventorying spaces. Because in some instances, I will take that inventory, and I will advertise it online when I advertise my auction. So if during this process my managers see something, or if they see a unit that looks like it's above average in terms of the type of property that they sell, they're going to sell, they will call me up and they'll say, Tom, I want you to survey this space for me. And it, that survey is usually conducted by an auctioneer, property manager, or owner. So my managers call me and they say, Tom, I want you to survey a space. So they'll send me pictures while I actually go physically view the space. And if I look at that space and I agree that there are things that would benefit through different types of selling methods, then we conduct what we call the biopsy. The biopsy is where I go into the space and I look through boxes and I look for unusual items. And it's amazing that the, the type of property that I've been finding, especially over the last couple of years. So for example, I uh, found a unit not too long ago that when I did the biopsy, we found a really expensive stereo system. We found a lot of taped boxes with really nice things in them. And so what we did is we actually grouped those uh, items together, and I sold that particular space in lots. So I sold it in seven different lots. I had one lot of just taped up boxes. I had one lot of uh, plastic totes. I had one uh, lot that was just the stereo system. I had one lot of tools. I had one lot of miscellaneous household items, and so on. So that's called selling in lots. So we broke that down, sold it in lots, sold it for $3,500. Another thing that I do is what I call the advanced preview, and that's where buyers can actually come out to the property in advance of the day of the sale. And they can even put offers on a bidder sheet so that the buyers can raise those offers by phone, text message, or email. And then I start the opening bid at whatever the highest bid is on the bidder sheet. I also allow bidders to leave what's called proxy bids or absentee bids, where they say to me in writing, I'm willing to bid as high as X number of dollars. And then as the auctioneer, I write that down on a card, and I will actually bid for them up to that amount. Occasionally, I take property and I sell it via Craigslist or eBay. Actually, I prefer eBay because it's a competitive bidding venue. So the property has to be removed after your published date and time, and some property sells really well on eBay. I just recently discovered a uh, picture of Michael Jackson that was personally signed, and we actually pulled that out and sold it on eBay and got an ungodly sum of money for that picture that we sold online on eBay. And then there are special sales, unusual items like jewelry, baseball card collections, collector plates, as a matter of fact, Next Friday, I'm selling a collection of collector plates, almost 300 collector plates, and I'm selling those individually. Occasionally, I run into restaurant equipment. All of those things need to be sold by different types of methods, and you need to market that type of property directly to buyers that understand what that property is and how much that property is worth. So those are a lot of the new uh, auction techniques that we've been experimenting with and have actually been quite successful with. Now, here's something interesting. In these states, you can actually conduct both public or private sales. And you may have seen this in reading your statutes and wondered, what in the heck does that mean? Well, most sales should be conducted as public sales anyway. But occasionally, a private sale is more commercially reasonable depending on the type of property. For example, I did a sale a number of years ago where the contents of a storage unit belonged to an adult bookstore. And of course, we didn't want to offer the contents of that to the general public. Uh, so what we did is we actually conducted a private sale, and we invited uh, individuals that owned those types of establishments to come in and look at the unit. They bought the entire unit in its entirety, but we actually brought individuals in, privately showed them the, in, the items that were inside the space, and then we still sold it in a public method by allowing them to bid against one another. So occasionally, you might use a private sale for that reason. 
private sales were designed to allow you to dispose of the items that don't sell at the public sale. So for those of you that are in these states, Kansas, Kentucky, Maine, Massachusetts, Mississippi, Missouri, New York, Ohio, Rhode Island, Wyoming, you have the option of conducting a public sale. And if you have items that are left behind for some reason, or if you have a space with no bids on it, your statutes then give you the right to actually sell it privately. In other words, you can call someone up and say, come out here and just get it, or come and get it, give me $5 and take it away. So public versus private sale, kind of an interesting concept. In most states, if you postpone an auction, which I've had to do this once in the last five years, you must notify your tenants of the new date and time of the sale. Why? Because most lien notices contain uh, the following requirements, a conspicuous statement that unless the claim is paid within the time, uh, within that time, the personal property will be advertised for sale and will be sold by auction at a specified time and place. So it's not as simple as just postponing your auction by telling all your buyers, we'll come back next Friday, we'll do it next Friday instead. If you have to postpone an auction, tenants should be re-notified if the sale is postponed. In other words, you need to send them another letter, and in most states, you have to republish your ad in the newspaper again. So this should include a letter announcing the new date along with republication of the lien sale notice in the newspaper if your state requires that. Another problem that I see are facilities that cut locks on the day of the sale. Some facilities cut locks on the day of the sale, and this is not advisable at all. Most states require a description of the property to be advertised in the legal publication. So you can't describe what you haven't seen. So inventorying in advance allows a more thorough inventory and documentation, whether it's through video or pictures. And a common allegation made by plaintiffs is that the description of the property was inadequate. This is a problem area that we see all the time when, when customers sue storage facilities. It's not enough to just say miscellaneous personal prop, uh, property when you have a storage unit that's filled with business inventory. For example, I'm doing a sale next Wednesday and I have a storage unit that has over over 1,300 pieces of brand new clothing inside that unit. So the manager has actually been taking that clothing, putting it up on rods that we've suspended from the ceiling so that we can show that property. And actually, we've made phone calls to various dress shops in town because most of the clothing is for females. We've made phone calls to dress establishments and clothing stores in the area so that they can come out to the auction and bid on this space. So most self-storage inventories are not adequate for a defense in court. So if you stand there and you make a quick inventory while you have 35 attendees standing there waiting for you to start the auction, that's not the time to be conducting an inventory. So cutting locks on the day of the sale is not advisable. And in some states, it's impossible because of the wording of your statute. So you want to make sure you watch out for that. Let's talk about whether or not customers can attend the auction. Public sales, in many states, by the way, use the term public sale. Public sales are open to everyone, whether you like them or not. So lean customers have the right to attend the auction, especially in those states where you have to conduct the auction as an absolute auction, which we talked about a minute ago. So lean customers can attend, and they can bid on their own property if they qualify as a bidder. Now there's a distinction, because you should always allow them to attend. And whether or not they can bid depends upon whether or not they qualify. Now the way I qualify my bidders is that they have to give me their driver's license, I have a buyer's agreement that they have to sign, and if I'm dubious as to whether or not they have money on them, I will ask them to show me their credit card or to show me their cash, especially if it's a customer that says they're going to show up and bid on their own property. Now, lean customers can always attend. As a matter of fact, you should encourage that. But what you don't want is for the lean customer to misbehave or to run around and urge the other attendees to refrain from bidding against them. That's called collusion, and that is actually illegal for them to do that. So if I see that a customer is attending an auction and I think they're there to buy their own things back, I walk up to that individual, I introduce myself, I tell them I'm the auctioneer, and I explain to them that they're allowed to stay and watch, and they're allowed to bid if they qualify, but if they create any problem, I will ask them to leave. And if their behavior becomes disruptive, the police will call them and they'll be escorted off the property. But they do have the right to be there. If any attendees become disruptive or begin to engage in collusion, 
you can ask them to leave the property, and you should. So lean customers can attend your auctions. Matter of fact, you should encourage so that they can see that you conduct your auctions in a commercially reasonable way. Most states require, by the way, the facility to send an itemized statement of the owner's claim. If you read your statutes, see if it says this, because I want you to go read your, your letters to see if they comply. I'm sure your letters comply, but the reality is that most software programs have difficulty meeting this requirement. So you need to check your templates to see if you comply. So for example, in Maryland, Maryland in subparagraph II says, a statement of the operator's claim indicating the charges due on the date of the notice, the amount of any additional charges which shall become due before the date of sale, and the date those additional charges shall become due. Most software packages are not even capable of doing that. In other words, projecting out into the future and telling you what the lien charges are going to be. And all the plaintiff needs is one misstep in this lien foreclosure process, and they will say that you did not comply with the statutes in your state, and therefore you converted their property, and now they will show damages, and in some cases they'll ask for emotional distress damages as well. For example, in California, we run into this problem all the time, because California says an itemized statement of the owner's claim showing the sums due at the time of the notice and the date when the sums became due. Well, if you, in California, if you send your notes out right on time, which would be the 15th day and then the 30th day, you don't have a problem. But if you go back and you reprint notices after three months or four months for whatever reason, the software, more often than not, does not give you each month's itemization. It amalgamates everything into one number. So technically, it doesn't comply unless you go to your vendor and you have those notices changed. So this is something that you want to check out. In some states, which is interesting, some states will either give you um, the ability to send letters out by registered or certified. So for example, Alabama, Connecticut, Indiana, Missouri, New Hampshire, Oregon, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia says that notices shall be sent by registered or certified mail. Have you ever wondered what does that mean? Well. If a tenant is not in the United States, a facility cannot send them a certified letter, but they can send them an international registered letter. So if they're not, uh, if you're, if they no longer live in the United States, or if they send you a change of address and they say my address is now in Spain, in those states where it says certified mail or regular mail only, it's impossible for you to serve those people. Now what you can do is you can change your contract so that your contract says that if they reside outside the continental United States, that um, you can serve them by any internationally recognized carrier. But that would involve you actually um, putting that in your rental agreement. But in these states uh, that we're talking about, um, uh, Alabama, Connecticut, Indiana, Missouri, New Hampshire, Oregon, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, you have the option of using either method. So if a customer resides outside the continental United States, then you use registered mail, international registered mail. Let's go to the next slide. Many states do not allow for denial of access until the lien is perfected. Now this is interesting because some states specify that no enforcement action shall be taken for a period of stated days. Now, for example, in Tennessee, it says no enforcement action shall be taken by the owner until the occupant has been in default continuously for a period of 30 days. Uh, virtually every state has some limitation on when a tenant can be denied access. Some states require the owner to reserve the right to deny access via the rental agreement. Um, I'm going to pause here for a second. Um, Robin, are you still there? I am. OK. Um, can you, you know what, let me just advance to the next slide here. These states specify that no enforcement action will be taken until a specified number of days have passed. Well, what's interesting is when you look at the laws of other states, we have sort of the same in many other states as well. So for example, do you know what your state law prescribes for denial of access or what constitutes enforcement action? In some states, it's unclear. Now, for example, in California, access cannot be denied until the lien has been perfected. So this constitutes the mailing of a notice of lien sale. 
in those states that you see listed there, if you're in one of those states, those states are very clear that no enforcement action shall be taken until sometimes it's 30 days, 60 days, there's one state that's even 90 days. Enforcement action would be defined as overlocking and coding people out of the gate. So in those states, the legislators felt as though that before you can foreclose on a lien, you need to give the tenant time to actually remove the property that they might need to survive. And that goes back all the way to uh, about 1922, where we had several cases at the turn of the century where uh, people would have their, their homes foreclosed upon, and the bank would just simply show up with the sheriff and they'd throw everything out in their front yard. And so what would happen is they started passing legislation saying that before a person is subject to a lien, they need notification, right? They need to know that the lien is coming so that they could protect their interest. So in those states like Alabama, Colorado, Indiana, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Tennessee, Utah, it's pretty clear. It says no enforcement action. In states like California, it's, it's, it's clear, but it's, it doesn't specifically say no enforcement action, but it builds that denial of access and what constitutes that into the actual statutes themselves. Now, the reason that this is important is that if you prematurely deny a person access and you exercise dominion and control over their property, they can actually sue you for that and ask for damages. So you might want to rethink your uh, uh, overlocking policy and uh, when you uh, uh, actually code a person out of your gate system. So some states do not specify the number of days before lien enforcement begins. But premature denial of access constitutes dominion and control over the property being stored. So the ability to deny access to personal property varies widely from state to state. So make sure that you follow the law in your state, or at least make sure that you understand what the law is and what the implications are. Here's an interesting one. Do you have a redaction policy? Anyone can pay the rent, but you should protect the identity uh, of a customer from possible fraud or theft by redacting identifiable information. What is redacting? Well, redacting is the process of removing or unmasking unwanted or sensitive areas of a document prior to showing it to other people. So in other words, you take a magic marker and you mark out the unit number or maybe the tenant's address. For example, I'll tell you this quick story. I had a client that called me a while back. She said, Tom, I think we have a problem. I said, why? She said a lady called me and said that um, her husband followed her. They're getting a divorce. Her husband followed her to a storage facility, realized that she probably had a storage unit there. After she left, he went back the next day, walked into the office, and said, I'm here to pay the rent for our storage unit. So the manager says, oh, OK, what unit number? He goes, I don't know. What name? So he gave the name of his wife. Manager pulled it up. You know, you're actually, your rent's not due yet. And he goes, eh, well, I'm here. I'll go ahead and I'll pay it anyway. So he paid $85 rent. Manager printed out a receipt, handed it to him. He folded it up, put it in his pocket, walked out the door. Came back that afternoon, waited outside the facility, tailgated someone else into the storage facility, and uh, went down to her unit, cut off her lock, took everything out that he said was, quote, his property. And he went back home called her up and said, hey, I got my stuff out of your storage unit. She goes, how did you even know I had a storage unit? And he laughed. So she says, well, how did you know which one? Laughed again. And he says, well, because uh, I actually uh, went into the office and paid the rent, and they gave me a receipt and had the, the storage unit number right on the receipt. So my client called me saying, Tom, do we have a problem here? And I said, well, you know, the industry does not have a redaction policy, per se, but it brings up a really good point. So when you give non-tenants, non-tenants, a handwritten receipt, uh, or if you give them a receipt that's generated by the computer, you should redact the unit number so that the individual doesn't know exactly what unit number the tenant is in. So uh, I've actually changed my templates and my software to do this, but I've also instructed my employees that if a non-tenant tenders payment, whether it's a letter or whether it's a, a receipt that comes out of our software, we take a magic marker, and we redact the unit number, and we redact the address so that that person doesn't know exactly what storage unit that the customer is in that they're paying for. Another question that comes up pretty often is, can I refuse cash? While cash is legal tender, there's no federal law that says that you have to accept cash. Now, if you adopt a non-cash policy, your tenants must be notified in writing. And the non-acceptance of cash does complicate things like lien payments and merchandise sales. 
And money orders are often used in lieu of cash at facilities that don't like to accept cash for security reasons. But remember that purchasers of money orders can stop payment on personal money orders. A bank money order, no. But a personal money order, yes. But yes, you can refuse to accept cash. This is commonly done in the apartment business. Can I refuse foreign currency? Uh, yes, you can. Storage facilities are not required to accept foreign currency. However, in some areas, it might be prudent to accept it. We had a fact pattern not too long ago in a case where a guy showed up uh, about 10 minutes prior to an auction. He was a Hispanic male, and he wanted to pay his rent in cash, and or uh, in pesos. And so the manager says, no, you have to pay me in cash. So she turned him away. She didn't accept the pesos. And so they called me up and said, do we have a problem? And I said, what town are you in? And she told me, and I said, oh, man, you're only like six miles from the border. And uh, as a matter of fact, most banks in border towns, even you know US banks, will actually do currency exchanges with no problems whatsoever. And you can jump on the internet, and you can get the conversion rate in about 30 seconds from probably 200 different websites. Now, you're not required to accept foreign currency. But when someone walks into your office, in a border town, they want to pay in pesos or they want to pay in Canadian dollars, you might want to at least give them some time, tell them if you'll be back by 5 o'clock this afternoon, I'll tell your space on contingency, you can convert it into U.S. cash. Whatever you decide to do, it doesn't matter. But use caution when tenants attempt to pay just prior to an auction, especially if your rental agreement does not address payment methods. So be clear in your rental agreement about how liens must be paid. So for example, in my rental agreement, it says that all payments made to satisfy outstanding lien amounts and charges shall be paid in lawful money of the United States by certified check, cashier's check, money order, or cash. And that way you reduce any problems whatsoever, especially if you're in a border town. Uh, let's look at the next topic here. Privity of contract. Only the parties to a contract may claim the benefits of the contract or incur any liability of the contract. But there's a problem that we see all the time in storage. If a manager has no notice or knowledge of the existence of a third party, then the third party cannot claim any benefits or incur liability from the contract because of the lack of privity. And privity means, were they there when the contract was signed? But third parties can create problems when the manager knowingly accepts payments or has knowledge that a third party has interest in a storage tenancy. And this happens almost every day somewhere in the storage business. So when subletting, when you discover that customers come in saying, I know my name is on the lease, but it's actually her stuff, that's called subletting. When you discover that, you need to notify your tenant that that sublease arrangement is in direct violation of your rental agreement. And you might want to treat that party as a party of contact. Not that they have any specific rights, but they have a they are a party of contact. So third parties should be notified in the event that the facility is foreclosing on their lien if the identity of the third party is known. And we learned this lesson the hard way, by the way, in Cook versus public storage. In that case, what happened is uh, the parents of the tenant was actually listed as having uh, rights of access to the storage space. And the appellate court says, well, that, that's tantamount to a third party with interest, and therefore they should have been notified and treated just like the tenant. I don't agree with that decision, but it's a published opinion now. So make sure you consult your attorney regarding specific issues in your state about what types of duties you owe to third parties that you have knowledge or existence of. So you want to be careful to address that. Should I publish my contract on my website? The rental agreement is the cornerstone of legal protection for your facility. I, if I were you, I would not publish your rental agreement on your website. Because if you make a mistake or you improperly draft an unconscionable provision, you become a target for litigation. I sat down yesterday and I pulled up the first 10 rental agreements that I found published on the internet on self-storage websites. Eight out of the 10 rental agreements had problems in them. Problems. If your rental agreement is ironclad, then you're giving away free legal services to your competitors because they'll just copy your ironclad rental agreement. Many potential customers could be in from renting from you if they review your rental agreement via your website. You know, if they actually read it on the website in advance, they may not come and rent from you, even though most rental agreements are pretty much the same, because many of those provisions need explanation. 
And then the presence of late fees and deposits and limitation of liability values and restrictions, all that stuff may give away your competitive advantage to your competitors. So I don't recommend that you publish your contract on your website for those reasons. The rental agreement um, is a complicated legal document. And so oftentimes we'll see issues about whether or not I should print my contract in Spanish. Well, if you have a large Hispanic population, maybe you should, but you can't do this halfway. So if your rental agreement is in Spanish, for example, you should also have all of the other documents that the tenant receives translated into Spanish as well, because it's not fair for a Hispanic, non-English speaking individual to be given a rental agreement that they can understand, but then to be mailed notices and various forms used by the storage facility. So currently, no state law requires such storage facilities to storage rental agreements into any other language. So if a non-English speaking tenant executes a contract in Spanish, they are doing so at their own peril. But if you decide to provide this service to your customers, don't do it halfway. Make sure you have everything translated. By the way, uh, you can refuse contract changes. So for example, the rental agreement is exclusively under the control of the storage facility. The facility does not have to agree to all of the contract changes that a customer may want. So if your tenant asks to add another renter onto your account or to the access list, you can refuse that, by the way. You don't have to allow them to add every Tom, Dick, and Harry that they want to add to the uh, rental agreement, either for access or for additional parties or whatever. If a tenant wants to add another party for access, refuse that. Now, you can't refuse to add additional parties to a contract based upon discrimination factors such as race, religion, national origin, age, sex, familial status, sexual orientation, disability, veteran status, things like that. But you can refuse to make modifications to your rental agreement if you feel as though those modifications may pose a danger or hazard to the facility or to other tenants. Most rental agreements contain what we call a limit of liability clause, but the standard $5,000 limit for every space at the facility is no longer advisable. It might be time to change that. So for limited liability clauses to be enforceable, to be enforceable, they need to be reasonable. Now, yesterday when I surveyed the 10 storage facilities around the United States that published their rental agreements on their website, I found that many of the facilities had a limit of liability limits that were way too low. So for example, one facility said our liability is limited to $250. Another facility said $1,000. One facility said $2,500. A few said $5,000. And one facility said their liability was limited to one month's rent. So the standard $5,000 limit, it's been, use, it's been in use in the self-storage industry now for about 20 years. And most self-storage lawsuits, by the way, if you look at the sizes, most self-storage lawsuits are large spaces. So you might want to consider changing your limit of liability language to a stated value per square foot, which is what I do now. So my stated limit of liability value per square foot is $50. So if you're in a 5x5, five five, you agree that your 5x5 five five is not worth more than $1,250. Or if you're in a 10x30, I limit the liability to $15,000. That type of uh, language is probably much more enforceable than a flat stated amount for everything. Which newspaper should I advertise in? Well, most states require you to publish in a newspaper a general circulation published in the initial district in which the facility is located. What does that mean? General circulation usually means that it's issued at least once a week or daily. It's intended for general distribution and circulation. And it's sold at a fixed price per copy per month or per year to subscribers and readers. So in other words, that tosses out all of the dandy dimes, the thrifty nickels, and the cheap quarter type uh, publications. Now, what's critical in the storage business is that your chosen newspaper needs to provide you with a proof of publication. In other words, someone in their legal advertising department clips those ads out, and then they stamp those as a notary certifying that that ad did run on the dates indicated on that proof of publication form that they sent you. So it's critical to get that. So you should advertise in those types of publications at a minimum to meet your statutory requirements. What about website coupons? I get this question a lot. Your website may contain some express offer or coupon. You are not required to honor a website offer subsequent to the rental if the tenant was not aware of the offer at the time of the rental. In other words, there has to be a meeting of the minds. 
So your tenant must be aware of an offer in order to be able to accept it. What happens is they rent a space, then they come back a week later and say, hey, I went to your website and there was a 50% 50, 50 off the first month's rent coupon on there. You should give that to me now. You actually have the option of saying, no, I won't honor that. But you have to decide whether or not that's in the best interest of your storage facility from a um, public relations perspective. So the best way to protect the facility from misunderstandings is to express condition on any and all advertised offers, whether it's on the internet, whether it's a coupon that you mail out, whether it's a coupon that you hand out. So for example, uh, some of the standard phrases that we use are must prevent coupon at the time of rental, limit one coupon per customer, not valid with any other offers, check the change, or some restrictions apply. So make sure that you use that type of wording. This is a fairly new uh, issue that's popped up just recently. Is it legal to copy a military ID card? You know, oddly enough, the federal law prohibits the copying of military identification cards. Under Title 18 of the U.S. Code Part 1, Chapter 33, Section 701, it prohibits copying a military ID, and it even imposes fines and imprisonment. And it's because terrorist groups place a high value on counterfeited or cloned identification cards. And so storage facilities can ask um, to see a military ID, or you could copy their driver's license or some other form of photo identification, but you should not make a photocopy of a military service member's ID. Storage facilities can copy that information down, but you cannot photocopy it. So are we ready for questions, Robin? Tom, we actually have quite a few questions that have come in, and we'll try and get to a few of them here before we run out of time. Uh, the first one is, Washington Self Storage Association had a law passed that states a commercially reasonable sale consists of at least five bidders. Um, your comments on that? Well, here's the problem. You know, we talked about the meaning, the word, the meaning of words. There's a difference between the definition of attendee and the definition of bidder. So if you take a room full of auctioneers and you say, can someone define what a bidder is? Because the term bidder is a, is a past tense, what is it, a past tense verb, Poppy? <laughs> if you use the word bidder, see, a bidder is an individual that has bid. And that's different from an attendee. I would have rather Washington had used the term attendee because that's just people that show up. Now, a, an aggrieved plaintiff, could, they could argue that you should have gotten at least five bids on a unit before it was sold. In other words, five people raising their hand or five people affirming to the auctioneer uh, you know, that they were interested in purchasing the space. Whether or not a plaintiff could make that argument successfully, I think most judges would sit there and go, well, but I think what the legislators intended was that you had at least five people show up. Now, this is where the buyer's agreement saves you, by the way, in Washington. Because in Washington, you can define bidder as an individual that is ready, willing, and able to bid, but may or may not choose to bid at the auction, right? So a bidder would be defined by your buyer's agreement. OK, next question. If you sell a unit for more than the amount owed plus your cost, do you get to keep the extra money? Uh, in a few states you do, in most states you do not. So in most states, the tenant is entitled to the excess proceeds, whatever they are. So once again, that varies by state. But the fact that you don't keep the money should not uh, inhibit your desire to try to get as much for the property as possible. That's why if you use an auctioneer, for example, you know, I do a few auctions for some of my friends, I have an incentive, Poppy, to get as much money as possible because I take a percentage of it. And whereas if the manager does their own auctions and the owner doesn't let you take a percentage, then aggrieved plaintiff's counsel will make an issue of that. They'll say, you had no incentive to get the highest and best price anyway. And you didn't make any effort to try to sell it for the highest and best value, and therefore there was no, pro there was no excess proceeds to give back to my client. As a matter of fact, they brought that issue up in Cook versus Public Storage. Okay, uh, next question. In Utah, when is lien perfected? In Utah, the lien is perfected upon the mailing of the notice, which is, as a matter of fact, most states are like that. You know, most states uh, will specify that perfection takes place 
when the notice is actually deposited with the United States Postal Service. Some managers think that perfection occurs when the notice is printed, but if you take the notice and you print it and you leave it sitting on the counter for a week, you haven't perfected your lien. You've perfected your lien when you've generated the notice, properly addressed it with postage prepaid or whatever your state requires, and you hand it to the postman. Because under what we call the, uh, the mailbox rule, once you give it to the Postal Service, it's assumed that it will reach its destination. So that's when um, lien perfection occurs, is when you've given the, uh, the notice. In most states, you've deposited that with the Postal Service. Uh, next question, um, what are the services your company provides? Uh, we do mostly consulting and training and, and fee-based management, but I do a lot of consulting and I do contract reviews and audits and things like that. So, yeah, we, we do a lot of, or I do a lot of different things and my assistants and things do as well. Next question, in Washington State, what constitute costs for an auction that can be kept before returning the excess bid money? Cost would be, for example, let's say that you decide, well, let's say you hire a professional auctioneer. The auctioneer says, look, in order for me to get a really good turnout, uh, as a matter of fact, I'm selling a unit next week with over a thousand pieces of brand new clothing in it. I'm having my managers actually call uh, dress shops and clothing shops in that area so that we can get those people to show up because I think that unit will bring a lot of money. So the time and the effort that you would use at a reasonable billing rate per hour, all of that is compensable. So for example, I did a farm auction about three years ago. I grossed over $180,000 in that farm auction. But as an auctioneer, I took a percentage, but I also, my client also paid me for the marketing cost. In other words, the additional ads that I put in the newspaper to get the buying audience to show up and buy this stuff. So all of those things that you do over and above the norm are all compensable. So if you spend time putting ads on uh, auctionzip.com or uh, you have someone come out and actually look at the property for you to, to tell you what it is. I, mean, I read a, a blog just the other day that said that a unit was sold that was filled with the equipment that came out of a mortuary, right? So if you paid someone to come out and to look at that equipment to tell you what it is and what it should sell for, all of those types of expenses are compensable and can be added to the lien and recovered from the proceeds. All right, next question comes from someone located in hold on, uh, North Carolina. Question is, we obtained the information for a tenant on the phone with his promise to come in and sign the lease agreement. He never came in to sign. He paid one month and hasn't paid since. What are our options since we don't have a legally signed lease agreement? Well, the safest route, if you don't have the protection that's provided by the rental agreement, is to contact an attorney and to treat that space as abandoned property because all states have abandonment statutes and so under the abandonment statutes they very closely follow the Uniform Commercial Code which means that you'll send a notice out to the address that you have and that you'll do a more detailed inventory than you would generally do under the storage statute and then you'll put an ad in the newspaper advertising that person's name and the fact that you're going to sell their property if they don't satisfy your lien. So it's very similar to what you would do. But the problem is, is without a properly executed rental agreement, you wouldn't use uh, you wouldn't use the uh, North Carolina revised statutes that apply to sell storage because you don't have a signed rental agreement. So you would have to consult an attorney to get some help on that one. All right. Next question: Is it better to make a deal with the with a the owner, which I'm assuming is the unit renter, for a per portion of the amount owed rather than holding an auction. Yeah. Now, you're always better off to do that. Now, that's actually called an accord and satisfaction. And so those types of agreements should always be memorialized in writing because we've had several lawsuits over the last couple of years where the manager has verbal agreements with tenants, but they don't put them in writing. And what, what happens is, the manager says, look, you owe me 700 how much can you give me? The customer says, I can give you 300 but uh, I need you to move out by Saturday. The customer says, okay, no problem. So what happens is they give you 300 and they don't move out by Saturday. The problem is, is you didn't prescribe any method of enforcement when they don't move out by Saturday. What the plaintiff is going to invariably say is that our new accord was that I only owed 300 I no longer owed 700 
could see if you have a settlement agreement or I use one. I, my agreement is called an accord and satisfaction agreement. And it says I'm taking less than what you owe me, but in exchange for that, you agree to be out by Saturday and I prescribe the remedy. If you are not out by Saturday, then you give me an interest in the property. It now becomes mine and I can do anything I want with it, would include, which will include uh, disposal or selling the property as I see fit. So you want to have something in writing memorializing arrangements like that. And uh, go ahead and take one more question here because we're out of time. At, one, at what point in the lien process can you cut off the lock to see what's in a unit, especially if you are using a professional auctioneer? Uh, in most states, you can cut the lock usually within two weeks after you send them the notice, whatever that notice is that your state prescribes, and before you publish the ad in the newspaper. So that's critical. In other words, you can't you can't publish the nature of property that you haven't seen. So you have to view the property before you publish it in the newspaper. Now, what I do is when people say to me, Tom, the auction is on uh, Wednesday. As a matter of fact, um, I'm having an auction on Wednesday in Indiana. So on Tuesday, the manager and I will go out and we will look at some of the units to see if we want to treat them differently, you know, sell them in lots versus selling them item by item or selling them in their entirety or dressing them up a little bit, moving things around and moving mattresses and that kind of thing. I usually do that poppy the day before the auction or the morning of, realizing that I'm trying to wait to the last possible minute before I actually go into that unit to survey it, biopsy it, or showcase it. But once again, that's something that managers probably shouldn't do without the express permission of their owner or their auctioneer. You want to have a disinterested third party get involved in things like that if you're going to do it. But I can tell you this, now that I do it that way, I get 70, 80, 90, a dollar for a dollar at my auctions now. I rarely ever sell units for 5 and 10 and $50 anymore since I've been using those techniques. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Tom, for all of this great information. I've had several questions uh, about whether the webinar will be available for viewing. Uh, yes, it, it will be available in our archives. You will receive an email from us within the next few days giving you that information. Those questions that were not answered due to time constraints, Tom will be answering you personally after the email, after the uh, webinar is concluded. We'd like to thank everyone for attending, and we hope we provided you with useful information to assist you in your self-storage endeavors. Along with the email about the uh, archived webinar, you'll also receive a special offer for the purchase of any of Tom's books that are available through Minico. So make sure you watch your inbox for that email. And last but certainly not least, for information about our upcoming webinars, please visit our website at ministoragemessenger.com. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Good luck.